much she traveled, and knowing women who made a difference. A Cooler Kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview with Dolly Osborne conducted on April 28th, 2006 by Luke E. Part 1. When did you start, or when did you get signed by the your first team in the AAPGBL? Um, when I was 13, I tried out at home um, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and the first year I tried out, they said I was too young and a little bit small, uh, as you could see from my uniform. Um, the next year, when they came barnstorming through again, through Charlotte, I tried out again as a pitcher. And um, then I was signed. I was 14. Uh, I was signed by Jimmy Fox, and Jimmy Fox is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, he was uh, second in home runs uh, to Babe Ruth, and uh, so Jimmy was my first manager. Then at the end of school, they didn't really let you out of school to go to spring training or anything. I missed spring training, unfortunately. Uh, then I went there as soon as school was out, and I had turned 15 the day school was out. So I left the day after my 15th birthday, and I played for uh, Fort Wayne, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and they were called the Fort Wayne Daisies. And I actually was kind of a bullpen pitcher. I was a relief pitcher for the first two years of the Daisies. And then I was traded to South Bend. And uh, then I became a uh, regular pitcher in rotation. So were you ever discriminated for being a woman playing baseball? Um, if, if anyone said anything, I, I guess I didn't pay attention to it. <laughs> so there really wasn't much discrimination? No, I didn't, I didn't have any. Um, I played on a boys team prior to going to, um, play for Fort Wayne. And, uh, it was called the Selwyn Park Rebels. And, um, I, the whole league was boys team. And I never experienced any problems with any of the guys uh, or any of the parents. Um, as a matter of fact, most of the guys who were on our team, especially, were my friends. You know, I we hung around together all the time. We played basketball together. We played football together. We played everything together. So they were they were like my brothers. The whole team was just like a brother to me. So I I never really experienced any. When we played women's baseball, the people who came, came to the game came to see the women play. And uh, this was in 1950s, I think in the 40s when the league first started, they did have a little bit of discrimination. Uh, but later, I didn't ever run into any of it. Uh, I don't know if some of the women did. Um, I, And if anyone said anything, I just totally chose to ignore it because we were having fun, we were doing what we wanted to do, and it didn't matter what people thought. <laughs> yeah. So in 1955 the league ended, right? 54. 54? It was a la 54 was the last year, mm -hmm. yeah. So then why, why do you think the league ended? Well, television prior to the 50s, had, most homes didn't have television. We didn't have it until probably after 19... 54, 55, uh, in my home. Um, I think I watched a ball game on a screen that was five inches big in 1951, 52, and the person who owned the television set was the only person in the whole community that had one, so all the kids used to go watch a ball game, except we practically had to sit on top of each other because you couldn't see that five-inch screen, you know, we were back jammed in there because you couldn't see anything. And this, but um, I think television. Uh, most homes by then had television. Uh, I know in South Bend we had uh, two strikes. We had a company called Studebaker that made cars. They left and went to uh, Canada, uh, so a lot of people were out of work. Bendix was there. They had a strike. Um, and that was just, just our town, South Bend, that had several strikes that year. 
And I think more more things to do. People were more mobile. Were getting more money. Uh, gas was cheap then, so I think people were doing a lot of other things. And um, I think most teams, uh, many sporting teams, have run into that since women's basketball. Same thing. There's so many things to go see. You know, there's hockey and there's there's basketball and there's this and there's that and there's all the kids games and everything I, I think things are becoming more organized when I was a kid you went to the ball games because there wasn't really that much to do you listened to them on the radio and that was it and we didn't have like organized kids games uh, we didn't have organized baseball we built our own field we built our own stands we cleared our own field we just found a field and cleared it and uh, of course, you couldn't really do that now. People no. would get excited they because get, they wouldn't yeah. want you on their property. Because if you got hurt, somebody might sue them. Back then, no one did that. And no one really cared. No, they didn't care. We just—they said, "Sure, go ahead, clear the field, have a good time." We cleared the field. We and I, we stole my dad's lumber and nails, uh, and uh, built our own backstop, built our own stands. We didn't have any fans, but we built stands anyway. So, I mean, you know, it was, um, you had to do a lot of things for yourself because nothing was organized for us. Uh, and we actually, we organized our league. Uh, I, my brother, who played baseball, was a first baseman and a pitcher. And uh, he knew a guy who ran a sporting goods store. And Bob Sutton, who owned the sporting goods store, organized the boys' league. And uh, I was the only girl in the league, uh, and he's the one who organized it. I mean, we didn't have, everyone didn't have teams like they do now. I think it's great that they do, but back then you didn't. You just played what they call sandlot ball. All the kids got together and played, you know. And you got to play every position because most of the time there wasn't enough kids to cover every position. You played shortstop, you played shortstop second and third. <laughs> so we have to play. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and if you played second base, you played second base and first base. When it was a play at first, you ran over to first. And <laughs> you got to cover the whole side you of your field. cover the whole side of the field, yeah. And sometimes the catcher was on the opposing team because there weren't enough players to have a catcher. So we had to put, he had to put his players out, and if he didn't, everybody got after him. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so, so, so you... The only, you had a maybe a pitcher and someone to cover the left side, someone to cover the right, and maybe two people in the outfield. You might have one who covered the whole field. The center fielder just sits there. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and what happens is if it's a right-handed batter, you, you move a little the bit right over here. Yeah, center. and if it's a left-handed batter, you move to right center. So you tried to learn to switch hit so you could, um, or learn to place hit so you could put it where the, one outfielder wasn't standing. So it was an interesting game. It was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, I, I played until 1954 and then went on tour. And when we went on tour, we played men's teams. All the towns had town teams, like the loggers, except most of them weren't as organized as the loggers. They were like, uh, Oh, West Salem might have a group of guys that got together and practiced twice a week and played on Sunday. Um, and some of them were former major leaguers uh, who went back to those towns to live after they retired. Uh, some were college players, like the loggers. Uh, some were just farm guys who used to play high school ball. You know, and we switched pitcher and catcher because a lot of times their pitchers, when they let go of the ball, they had no clue where it was going. <laughs> so we didn't want to kill all our girls. There were only uh, 11 of us on the road, so we didn't want, we couldn't afford to get too many people hurt. Plus, you have to remember that was before helmets. We had no helmets. Uh, and you had to learn to get out of the way of the ball. You know, if it came inside. So uh, that's another reason we switched. We didn't want to get get killed before the end of the tour because we toured for three months and covered a lot of miles. We played in almost every state in the union. 
for three, four years, maybe four years. So you lived in North Charlotte, North Carolina, right, Charlotte? Right, that's where I was raised. And that's where you got signed? Yes. Uh, two teams, they had spring training. And one year, actually, they had spring training in Cuba. I was sorry I wasn't in the league then and didn't get to go to spring training. But they had spring training. And then two teams would tour back to the Midwest and play each other on the road. They'd have like two buses, one team, one bus, one there. And they played like demonstration games uh, all the way from wherever they had spring training. They used to play in every town. So Charlotte would always have them play there because we had a class C, class C baseball team that belonged to the Washington Senators which uh, used to be the Washington Senators. Now they have a team there now, but they moved to, from Washington. The Montreal Expo. No, they became, they became the uh, Twins. They moved to Milwaukee, I mean to uh, the Twin Cities here. Yeah, they moved to Minneapolis, St. Paul and became the Twins. They were the Senators and Washington's moved there. So when you were playing for your, the team where you, after the league was canceled or ended did you ever meet any of your little or not your um, but any of people you looked up to when you were little when you were a kid did you ever meet any um, of those players yeah we met some um i don't remember who all they were uh we didn't meet anyone i think most of the ones who were like well-known names were probably stayed in the league longer and probably didn't play after they left the league. Um, but we did have some that that were managing in our league. Um, Jimmy Fox is probably the most recognizable name. Um, the manager that I had was not extremely well known for his playing days, but he probably knew more about baseball than anybody I ever met. Uh, his name was Bill Allington. Um, I did um, meet a guy that I eventually married um, when we played, and he played professional ball too. He was a pitcher. He tried out for the Braves. His name was Clem Osborne. He tried out for the Braves and um, played for a while in the Braves uh, organization, and then I think he was traded over to the Cleveland Indian organization. So he played for a while for the Cleveland Indians. Um, I think it was class class A or class double A he played. And um, he wrecked his arm. Back then when you wrecked your arm, you, you just put some salve on it and kept pitching or kept using it. Now they take you out and they do physical therapy on it and everything. And, didn't have the doctors and all that stuff. You put something on it called Adam Ball. Whew, was that stuff hot? <laughs> um, and then you put on a sweatshirt. And if you weren't careful, uh, if you got too hot, it would make blisters where you put it. It was really hot. Oh, that stuff was nasty. <laughs> so what was your motivation to try back out for the daisies once you got turned on when you were 13? Well, I wanted to play. I had seen them play. When I was six years old, um, my mom and I went to the movies once a week, uh, and they had what they call movie tones. If you've seen League of Their Own, I think they showed movie tones in that. It's black and white. That's the only way we got our visual news then. The Second World War was going on, and if you wanted to see what was happening in the war, sometimes it was a week or two weeks late. Uh, like what was happening over there by the time it got here visually, it was two weeks late. Uh, you went to the movies to see it because, like I said, there were no televisions. Uh, you could only get news over the radio. So they had movie tones, and in movie tones they had like interesting stories like the cat that played ping pong. And then they had movies, stuff about the war. And uh, then they would have uh, shorts, like, and they had one on 
women's baseball. <coughs> I think <coughs> that's when it first started in 1943. I was six years old. And I saw that. And I told my mother that's what I was going to do. And she said, yeah, okay. You know, little kids, they say they're going to do everything. You know, they're going to be a vet. They're going to be a doctor. And a lot of times they don't end up being that. <coughs> so I just enjoyed playing baseball, and I had played since I was five. I got my first glove when I was five years old. My dad bought it for me. My dad was a pitcher. And so I was just interested in it, and I thought, well, you know, they told me what I needed to do to make the team. I needed to grow a little bit, and I did do that. I didn't have any, <laughs> I didn't even have any control over that, but I did grow about three inches that next year. I did grow and I did gain some weight and I got a lot stronger and I worked out a little bit more. Uh, but we didn't have like weights and all that stuff that people have now. And uh, you just got out and ran. So I played more basketball and, and ran more and, and got in better condition and then decided I'd try out again. Were both your parents supportive of you trying back out? Oh yeah, they were. I think, I think I'd never been away from home before. People didn't travel then, or at least people who didn't have much money didn't travel then like they do now. But uh, I think my mom thought I'd get homesick and come home. That's why she agreed to it. Uh, and my dad, oh, he was always supportive of that. And my mom was supportive too. But I think she thought, well. She'll get homesick and come home, but I didn't. I was having too much fun and enjoying it too much, so I didn't get homesick. But I had gotten homesick before, and I never stayed with anybody. I never even stayed overnight with anybody. I wouldn't leave home. Um, but I guess you have to have a reason to leave home to, you know, <laughs> to not get homesick. <clears throat> this podcast brought to you from La Crosse, Wisconsin by the Cooley Kids at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.